Hello, I'm Dr. Parmi Giuntini from Otis College of Art and Design. Today we are at the fourth and last lecture about realism, the first movement of modern art. I've covered a lot of material, but it's important to remember that no lecture can address every single issue. It's why art historians keep researching, writing, and arguing. You should also have a clearer idea of the criticism that these realist artists had with academic art and the changes that they proposed. You probably also appreciate why that military term, avant-garde, was coined to describe them. We'll start today by looking at some of the popular visual culture about world fairs. These were a very new kind of modern public spectacle that began in the mid-19th century. World fairs are important to know about because they showcased so many things that people associated with being modern. Then we'll move on to the works of Edouard Monet, who shattered many of the cherished conventions of academic art with his controversial paintings. If you were living in London in the year 1851, the chances were good that you went to the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations. That's a long title for what we would call a World's Fair. This was the pet project of Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, and he was a great advocate of industrialization, progress, and innovation. The Great Exhibition was intended to showcase the industrial advances of modern nations as well as their colonial treasures. International or world fairs became popular in Europe in the 19th century because they were showcases for new technology and science. Countries exhibited not only their industrial advances, but their cultural treasures. People could stroll from one kind of geographical or cultural experience to another. A special building called the Crystal Palace was commissioned for the exhibition, and it defied what people thought proper buildings should be. Instead of stone, it was welded metal, wood, and glass. It rose like a gigantic spidery dome, punctuated by thousands and thousands of sheets of glass. It was temporary rather than permanent. In fact, after the exhibition, it was dismantled, moved from Hyde Park, and reconstructed in a slightly different form at Sydenham Hill. This plan of the Crystal Palace demonstrates the range of exhibitions. Cotton fabrics, jewelry, fine art, and musical instruments were shown along with machinery and new inventions. The exhibition was a huge success a marvelous spectacle as the word is used in the modern sense. People went in hordes to see it, to consume, to gawk at new inventions and machines, peruse crafts and fine art, stare at contributions from Africa and the Middle East. Tickets were cheap, so even factory workers could attend. One of the arguments that scholars advance today is that the government thought it was important for the laboring poor of London to see the tremendous industrial achievements of their country, to realize how advanced they were in comparison to the colonial world, rather than complain about low wages and poor living conditions. Only a few non-Western nations sent works to this first exhibition. India was one, and their huge stuffed elephant, along with natives wearing traditional dress, offered a stark contrast to modern European industrial works. Within the Crystal Palace, modernity was on display in a glass cage. The Great Exhibition of 1851 was just the start of a series of world's fairs, most of them held in England, France, and Germany, each one more elaborate and better attended. In 1883, the United States hosted the World's Columbian Exposition, often called the Chicago World's Fair, which lasted for six months and was attended by about 27 million people. France hosted the 1889 Universal Exposition, for which the Eiffel Tower was erected as the entrance archway and immediately became the architectural icon of modern Paris. 
That exhibition also boasted a massive machinery hall where new inventions in technology of all kind were on display, like this early version of the calculator, which won a gold prize. These modern spectacles, which ran for months and attracted millions of people, reinforced Western notions of superiority. Western belief in the advantages of technology and industrialization, and Western ideas about being modern. Academic painters like Henri Jevec and Louis Barrault were commissioned to make large contemporary history paintings that commemorated French success. Both works were commissioned by the government and intended to celebrate the achievements of the French Republic and its colonial empire that is clearly articulated in these paintings. Gervais paints a small native contingent literally surrounded by hordes of formerly dressed Europeans, most of them men, amid the modern construction of the exhibition hall. Likewise, Bureau presents the gloriously colored central dome area, which is crowned by an Islamic arch in recognition of France's northern African and Middle Eastern holdings. Most of the figures depicted are shown in modern dress, clustered in groups or moving through the hall. Central, and to the left, he depicts a few colonial figures, including two men in bright colored garments who stand somewhat stiffly posed, as though they themselves are objects of curiosity and display for a more modern public. It's easy to understand the lure of new inventions and the hunger that modern people had for innovation. They wanted better appliances, faster transportation, cheaper clothing, street lighting, and better sanitation. If you lived in a major city, these changes were happening all around you. You expected them. You welcomed them, especially if you were young, because the modern world promised opportunity and it welcomed challenges. So it is not surprising that many artists who considered themselves modern people were anxious to change the rules about art, to resist the status quo. The ultimate mid-century commentator on modernity was Charles Baudelaire, the French poet. And if he were alive today, we would consider him a kind of cultural commentator. In his famous essay, The Painter of Modern Life, Baudelaire identified the modern painter as a flaneur, male, urban, immersed in the crowd, observant and detached, in search of the modernity which Baudelaire described as ephemeral, the fugitive, the contingent, the half of art whose other half is the eternal and the immutable. Baudelaire was tired of academic paintings that depicted hackneyed literary themes paraded in historical costumes. He thought they were out of step with modern life. For Baudelaire, the hero of modern life was modern man, and the subject of modern life was anything contemporary, from city streets to brothels, from train stations to gardens. Edouard Monet exemplified Baudelaire's ideal modern painter. Monet was middle class, urbane, sophisticated, educated in art but unwilling to conform to academic standards. Monet consciously challenged the academy, both in subject matter and technique, and the public exhibition of his paintings, many of them at the salons, drew widespread and controversial attention. His 1863 Déjeuner sur l'herbe was an opening volley against the Academy in style, technique, and subject. He showed the painting at the Salon des Refusés, which Louis Napoleon had opened because the Academy had rejected so many works that year, around 4,000 of them. Monet's painting was definitely the hot topic of the exhibition. The title translates as Luncheon on the Grass, and the artist depicted four people enjoying a picnic outside in a park-like setting. The two men are fully dressed, but not the women. One is completely naked, although her fashionable clothes, including a spring bonnet, are piled up beside her. 
The other female is wearing a gauzy slip-like garment that is more like drapery than any 19th century dress. Painting fully clothed men and totally naked women was not new or controversial. European artists like Giorgione and Titian had been doing this since the early 16th century. In fact, as the novelist Emile Zola, an admirer of Monet, pointed out, there were about 50 paintings in the Louvre which featured naked women and clothed men, one of which was Giorgione's Pastoral Symphony. So why were critics and the public so appalled at Monet's painting? One issue was the painting's style. The female nude is depicted in very bright tones and there is no attempt to modulate the background. So she looks as though she is outlined and flat. That challenged the convention that a good artist would create figures with believable three-dimensionality. Then there is the female in that background, or what should be the background. It's hard to tell, since her lowered hand is so close to that of the reclining male. What has the artist done with perspective? The trees are shadowy. The background patches of vegetation are blurry. There is no consistent sense of a single light source, all of which made a stark contrast to the more accurate representations of the fruit in the still life in the front. It is as if the artist were deliberately calling attention to different ways of painting. These are not our contemporary concerns, but in 1863, the art critics looking at this work and writing about it had nothing good to say, except that Monet didn't know how to make a proper picture. Then there was the ruckus over the nude. Monet used a well-known female model, Victorine Meurin, and people recognized her at once. An academic artist like Ong would have idealized her features and body, which is what he did in this 1848 painting of Venus Adromeda. This was the expected convention. Then, regardless of the full frontal nudity, the idealization of the model demonstrated the artist's expertise and shifted the figure from a naked woman to a female nude. This was critical. This changed the discourse from looking at a naked woman to appreciating art. Remember that these were the same audiences who were concerned about the appropriateness of the female nude in photography. They needed those idealizing techniques. Monet did not do that. He painted the model's face so that people could recognize her and her body is not perfected. An academic artist would have expunged that crease of stomach flesh which is perfectly normal when sitting in that position. To make matters worse or more realistic, depending on which position you take, she faces the audience, directly gazing at them, which was highly inappropriate. Audiences were just not used to that kind of direct gaze from a female nude. What they expected was something along the lines of Alexandra Cabanel's version of Venus, which is an exact contemporary of Monet's work. Kapanal painted a very idealized nude, a Venus floating on the water with winged pudi above her. She shields her face with one arm while allowing the viewer full access to her nude body. This is the standard that Monet was up against, and it had been established for centuries. The direct gaze that Monet painted shattered that fragile curtain of artistic and aesthetic propriety. To complicate matters, he painted her dress and fashionable bonnet on the grass next to her, which was a fairly clear indication that he wanted you to know she had clothes, modern clothes, but had taken them off. Rather than an elegant classical pose, his model sits very casually with one leg bent, her exposed and naked body clearly visible to the two fully dressed men nearby. To the back and center of the painting, another young woman wearing a loose gown is completely bent over. That kind of pose sent a very clear message to the audience that the woman was not wearing a corset. So underneath that gauzy drapery, she was naked too. 
Look closely at her arms. If she were to stand up without moving them, she would be in the classical Venus Pudica pose with one hand over her breasts and the other over her genitals. With his interest in the expressive potential of paint and his fascination with modern subjects, Monet critiqued ideas of representation and reality and pushed at the boundaries of acceptable subject matter. The female nude seems a very calculated choice on which to make a stand. While the most erotically posed female nude was completely acceptable in fine art, as long as some literary or historical allusion was supplied, usually a Venus, Parisian audiences were appalled at the idea of looking at a naked woman. It was the allegorical associations that linked female nudity with ideal qualities of virtue, purity, and beauty. As long as the semblance of allegory and literary references were maintained, the female body was fair game for fine art. While Monet did not question the appropriation and display of the female body by the male artist, he preferred to strip away the academic illusions surrounding her representation. The modern female nude was not a Venus, or a Diana, or a Sabine daughter, but a model, a real person, and she could be a woman bathing, dressing, awaiting a lover, even a prostitute. Perhaps this was his way of letting the Academy know that he fully understood the rules. He just didn't want to follow them. They didn't make sense to him anymore, not as a modern artist working in a modern world. Avant-garde painting techniques and using identifiable models lessen the sense of timelessness, locking the figures and the scene into the contemporary world. Clearly, Monet had paid attention to what Courbet had been preaching. Just two years later, in the 1865 Salon, Monet once again shocked art audiences with Olympia, now established as an icon of modernity, but that year the painting caused an enormous brouhaha. Once again, the artist played off a well-known painting, Titian's Venus of Urbino. Titian did not title the painting that when he did it. That happened later. Scholars today generally agree that this was a commissioned portrait of a courtesan who had become the mistress of a wealthy Medici lord. She is shown completely naked in a lush domestic interior holding a bouquet of flowers with a small dog curled up at her feet. In the background, Two maids with clothing are shown in front of a richly carved cassoni, which was a kind of wedding chest used for storing a new bride's clothes. A current interpretation is that the painting commemorated not only the nude beauty of the courtesan, but also her position as an official mistress. She has essentially been moved into her lover's home. Monet's version featured a naked female lying on a bed, wearing only fashionable mules, a red flower in her hair, jewelry, and a velvet neckband. She is complemented by a black cat and a dark-skinned turban woman, holding a large bouquet of flowers. The space is flattened with little sense of perspective. The female figure is painted in pale yellowish and beige tones, heavily outlined in black paint. One hand covers her genitals with fingers sharply bent, and she boldly stares at the viewer, lacking the expected downcast eyes, demure expression, coy glances, or modesty that Titian took care to show. What caused the critical outrage against Olympia in 1865? Out of 60 critics, only four had anything positive to say about the painting, and they were drowned in the outcry. Why were those same critics so accepting of paintings like The Birth of Venus by Cabanal just two years earlier, even though that work seems much more erotic and alluring, with the body rendered in peachy skin tones and posed to display breasts and the pubic area? 
One aspect of the critical disclaim was Manet's painting style, which it was generally agreed was bad, poorly done, lacking any technical ability. The pose was criticized for its lack of beauty and proportion. One critic likened the figure to a female gorilla. Manet's refusal to idealize the figure, to round her proportions and create a silky finish to the skin tones, negated any sense of female beauty, causing another critic to write that the figure's facial expression made her look like a vicious old woman and her body like a corpse. Yet another critic described her as prematurely aged with a putrid body. The lack of modeling, the strong outlines, the stark contrast between light and dark areas created an undeniable flatness to the entire painting. An attention to the fact that it was a painting, almost as if the artist wanted the audience to dwell on the inconsistencies. There was no way to judge Olympia by academic standards without finding it wanting. It looked rough, unfinished, and poorly executed, and critics were not shy about pointing that out. On style alone, Monet challenged the known and accepted aesthetics. And as we talked about with Dejeuner Salurbe, the idealizing techniques were critical to transforming a naked model in one studio into a female nude. Then there was the issue of subject matter and the nude. And this is another area in which Monet clearly threw down the gauntlet. It's critical because it meshes the fine art world with 19th century popular culture. The name Olympia was well known in Paris because it was a popular street name for prostitutes. And that fact was not lost on the audience or the critics. Even the pro-Monet critic Jean Ravenel described Olympia as a faubourienne, a working girl of the night. The painting is littered with clues that allude to prostitution. She reclines on plump pillows and a figured fringe shawl, wearing only jewelry, fashionable mules, a flower, and a black ribbon. Audience recognize the style of shoes, the bindings on the bedding, the upholstery fabric. It's clearly a contemporary setting with nothing to historicize it. No vague landscapes, oceans, drapery, urns, pooty or columns. It is a bedroom, a scene grounded in the here and now. And for audiences, women who languished around naked in bedrooms with maids coming in carrying bouquets of flowers were probably prostitutes those flowers were probably a gift from an admirer, but an admirer who paid. The dark-skinned turban maid is another reference to the colonial working poor in Paris and conveyed a sense of exoticism to audiences who were already accustomed to associate the non-Western female with heightened sexuality and mystery. The final piece de resistance was the inclusion of a black cat who arches suggestively at the foot of the bed. When Titian painted the Venus of Urbino, it was common to include a small dog in the portrait of a female. The dog carried associations of sexual fidelity. Jan van Eyck had done the same thing nearly a century earlier in his portrait of the Arnolfini, and it was still a practice in the 17th century when Bronzino made this portrait of an unidentified woman with a puppy. Even in the 19th century, cats were popularly associated with female sexuality and eroticism. They were soft and silky, and they could scratch. And that may very well have been Monet's reason for substituting a cat for the dog. It would have made little sense to associate a prostitute with sexual exclusivity. Prostitution was well established in Paris, London, Rome, and just about every major or minor city in Europe. Prostitutes ranged from cheap back alley streetwalkers to high-priced courtesans working out of elegantly appointed brothels. Although morally condemned, visiting a brothel or taking a mistress was an expected and quite tolerated part of life for many men, 
especially the bourgeoisie and landed classes, for whom arranged marriages or marriages for social advancement were still quite common. T.J. Clark has written extensively about the 19th century Parisian world, Monet and Olympia. His interpretation takes into consideration all the criticisms of the painting and suggests that they mask deeper cultural concerns about contemporary morality, prostitution, and female sexuality. Monet's refusal to idealize his model in Olympia and the inclusion of telling contemporary elements may have startled audiences into acknowledging the reality of sexuality in painting and in their own society. The model's direct stare, which so unnerved the critics, referenced one of the undeniable practices of modern Paris, prostitution, and the commodification of sex for money. In fact, one of the critics noted that the model's hand covered her sex and would only be lifted for payment. For a predominantly male audience, and that was the audience that controlled art and culture, a female nude stripped of her classical associations was a problem. With all this concern over the female nude, you might wonder, whatever happened to the male nude? Hadn't he been a staple of Western art and culture since antiquity? Not just in paintings, but in sculpture, much of what was always intended for public spaces. Aligned with notions of strength, authority, truth, valor, and honor, the male nude had occupied a unique position in both the pagan and the Christian world. Where did the male nude fit in the modern world? Not surprisingly, the answer is that he didn't, or at least not with the same level of acceptance that surrounded the female nude. While the 19th century world eagerly embraced many modern and liberal notions, it was still very conservative in many ways. As we have seen, sexuality was at the top of the list, at least in terms of making visible, public, and acceptable what occurred in private. If you take a moment and consider the battles that 20th and 21st century society have addressed in order to guarantee racial and sexual equality, it is easier to understand why the newly modern 19th century world found the issue of the male nude increasingly problematic. Academic artists may have continued to include the male nude in history paintings, but not in works that addressed contemporary subjects. Like the avant-garde, they too agreed with Baudelaire's description of the modern man. He wore a dress coat or a frock coat, and these indicated political beauty and universal equality. Along with the avant-garde, they expanded on formal dress to include other fashionable variations of casual men's clothing, stylistic or seasonal changes, and clothing that identified differences between working and bourgeois class men. In Monet's 1868 painting of Lunch in the Studio, the white pants and straw boater were fashionable items that men wore in the summer. He emphasizes the bourgeois status of the man with little details, the striped shirt, which was very fashionable the tie, and the glimpse of gray gloves in his pocket. It's a quite different rendition than the man's clothing in Boating from 1874, where the white clothing and straw hat would indicate summer fabrics and summer time, but the short sleeves were a dead giveaway that this is a working class man. As business and commerce increasingly defined a modern society, as city life and leisure activities expanded, as fashion exploded into a new industry, the representation of the modern man in modern garb became the norm. The activities of the modern man were couched in terms of economics, science, technology, industrialization, all activities that were conducted fully dressed. There was increasingly little reason to use a male nude to communicate power. That was accomplished through the suit, which became the single defining male garment of modernity. 
Because male fashion was never subject to stylistic extremes like female fashion, a tailored dark suit accented with crisp white linen seamlessly moved into the niche once occupied by the male nude and appropriated all the associated connotations of power and strength, authority, and universality. Male artists readily understood that since they were eager participants and active consumers. Because the suit offered a structured, generalizing garment that essentially treated the male body as a rectilinear form to be sheathed, it also conveniently masked concerns of sexuality, including homosexuality, a term which first surfaced in the late 19th century. More than anything, the suit came to define the modern man. And because suits were mass-produced, even working men were able to own one. It's interesting to consider how the suit shifted notions of modernity by comparing two paintings that were barely 10 years apart. Millet and Monet paint two very different representations of men. As we have noted earlier, Millet's style incorporated more of an academic approach, which tended to idealize his subjects. Here he depicts a peasant couple who have stopped their work midday to pray in response to the Angelus bells. There is nothing fashionable about their clothing. It is dun colored, rather nondescript, utilitarian, and probably made at home. Its very lack of detail and fashion helped underscore Millet's interest in communicating peasant dignity and lends a timeless quality to the painting. It is quite different, however, from what Monet offers in From the Balcony. This is fashion and modernity front and center, an apartment in the newly redesigned Paris that is as elegantly decorated with urns and vases, potted plants and paintings, as it is with the three stylishly dressed figures who were all friends of the artist. Bert Morisot, the Impressionist painter and Monet's sister-in-law, sits and stares, apparently quite bored. Franny Kloss, a close friend of the artist's wife, stands clasping a parasol. Between the two women and grounding the compositional pyramid is Antoine Guillaume, a painter best known for his naturalistic landscapes. He stands with his hands slightly spread as though to clap them together in the next moment and summon the female group to some activity. Despite the darkness of the background, Manet has clearly detailed his suit. A dark jacket and a waistcoat, a stiff collared dress shirt and a brilliant blue tie whose colors offended the critics along with the green of the railings, both of which they considered too jarring. There is nothing relaxed or casual about his pose or posture. He is clearly a man in charge, and his suit reinforces that authority. Monet is the link between French realism and Impressionism, with his insistence on flattened space, his critique of representation, and his focus on contemporary subjects. Spared of the political agenda that tinged the works of Millet and Courbet, the financially independent Manet was free to paint whatever he pleased. His subjects ranged from elegant social piers painted on new Parisian balconies to public dances like music in the Tuileries or bar hostesses in Bar at the Follies Bergère. His viewpoint and presentation is consistently that of the male flaneur. For him, modernity was urban Paris, street life, and cafes. Private life lived in the public eye. It was always modernity from a man's point of view. As an artist, he continually played with conventional practices and rules. Not for him the high academic finish. His brush strokes are strong and obvious, his perspective flattened, his colors often brash rather than blended. He never wanted the audience to forget they were looking at a painting, and a painting done in a new, modern way. Realism wedged the opening into the guarded fortress of academic art, and Monet was one of the lead players. 
As a vital part of the avant-garde Paris art scene, he became the mentor for the next generation of modern artists, the Impressionists, who took his ideas about painting even further in their efforts to free art from the confines of academic rules and establish a universal experience and language for art in a modern world. We'll stop here with realism because by the early 1870s, those avant-garde ideas about subject and style were being pursued in somewhat different ways by other artists who eventually came to be labeled the Impressionists. Remember that change, progress, innovation, these are all defining characteristics of being modern. No matter how successful a new development was, or a new invention, or an artistic style, the modern world always expected more. And avant-garde artists, being citizens of the modern world, always responded with new ideas that they thought would be the final answer. This is both the optimism and the Achilles heel of being modern. Next time, we're going to look at the ways that the Impressionists wanted to picture modernity.